Today I decided that uh, we'll be talking about some real practical things uh, what happen in the ICU, especially during this COVID times. So I thought it very apt to label this presentation as oxygen. As you saw, there was a lot of uh, hue and cry, a uh, lot of patients dying and everywhere there was uh, uh, only one thing that was uh, resounding in all the channels and everywhere oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. So I thought it apt that uh, we'll discuss some aspects about oxygen. Uh, so there are certain myths that uh, oxygen, we, 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 the people hoarded oxygen, they took cylinders uh, uh, to their home, uh, they took respirators home. But uh, what is the role of oxygen is, is something that uh, some person can just uh, buy an oxygen cylinder and put uh, oxygen to himself. No, 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 definitely not. Uh, if you try to understand, human beings are microaerophilic. We are neither uh, aerobic or anaerobic. We require oxygen, but we require very small quantities of oxygen. Did you know that oxygen therapy produces vasoconstriction, systemic vasoconstriction? It's like a self-regulating mechanism. Oxygen sees to that that uh, there is no excessive requirement. It causes vasoconstriction, uh, which itself reduces the oxygen requirement. Oxygen therapy does not produce aerobic metabolism. We don't require... Uh, too much of oxygen for the aerobic metabolism, you require very a minimal amount. What happens if you give, let, uh, there is plenty of surplus of oxygen and I have a lot of money, I can buy plenty of oxygen cylinders or if I'm in the hospital, I can demand high flow oxygen and I get uh, excessive oxygen. The excessive oxygen is also dangerous. So what happens in all these uh, diseases, sepsis, or for that matter, a cytokine storm in COVID? So there is the there is a predominant role for what is known as accident injury. How is this accident injury produced? It is produced by oxygen. So what oxygen does is, if it is not reduced to water. The two free electrons outside, they act as free, free radicals. So they damage a lot of tissues, this uh, superoxide, uh, peroxide, all these act as uh, free radicals and cause a lot of, lot of tissue damage. Especially when there is inflammation, there are a lot of cells there. You know, inflammation causes a lot of cells to accumulate, that are WBCs. Uh, accumulate at the site of infl inflammation. So what happens is there's a lot of oxygen released, which further causes the free radicals to accumulate and causes a lot of tissue injury. So contrary to popular belief, there is no rationale in giving excessive oxygen or giving prolonged duration of oxygen because it's a drug with a very, very narrow therapeutic range. So more than any other drug which uh, we have seen in our practice, oxygen is a drug which needs constant monitoring uh, in ICU or in the ward. And it has a narrow therapeutic range in the sense that if you give more, it causes more damage to the human body. So there are different delivery systems uh, So because it should be regulated that causes the need to have different delivery systems. There is a low flow system. So sometimes you require very little oxygen. Then you have reservoir systems where sometimes you require moderate amounts of oxygen and high flow systems where you require real high flow oxygen. So this is a very good slide. It shows the low flow nasal oxygen where the, as the name itself suggests low flow, it is about 1 to 6 liters per minute, the usual nasal cannulas and the prongs. Then there is the standard face mask which gives about 5 to 10 liters of oxygen. Then there is the rebreather mask which I will be showing in the future side which gives about uh, 
more than 10 liters of oxygen non repetitive mask again use more than 10 liters usually up to 15 liters of oxygen then there is a special type of mask air entrainment mask uh, where the fio2 this word will be confusing when you hear it for the first time fio2 is the fractional insp inspiration oxygen concentration so in the normal atmosphere it's about 21 percent uh, when you use the low flow nasal oxygen it is about 24 to 40 percent the oxygen concentration in the normal air so that's the fio2 in the inspired air not in the expired air in the inspired air so in the air we inhale the concentration of oxygen this is fio2 so in low flow nasal oxygen it's about 24 percent in standard mask it's nearly about 50 uh, percent rebreather mask and non rebreather mask it's about 70 to 80 percent but what you can see is it's highly variable in all these uh, devices where it is whereas it is constant in this air entrainment mask that, that's why we have different devices for different purposes then this high flow nasal oxygen which has become very popular in uh, this covid times delivers very uh, high flows of oxygen 40 50 60 liters of oxygen so this low flow nasal oxygen which you commonly see in the icus and more, more commonly in the watts oxygen is delivered through the nasal cannula or prongs it's a very low flow as the name itself suggests it's one to six liters FiO2 is uh, the, the fractional inspi inspiration, the concentration of oxygen in the inspired air is about 24 to 40% and uh, it's variable. But the advantage of this is it's just a nasal prong. So the mouth is spared so the patient can talk, can eat. It uh, causes minimal disruption to his uh, routine activities. Standard face mask. Uh, they have a slightly higher uh, oxygen flow 5 to 10 liters per minute they achieve higher oxygen uh, FiO2 of 60 percent but because they cover the mouth they are more confining and then there are mass there is a mask with a reservoir back I'll be showing you the diagram so there are two types basically there is a partial rebreather which achieve, achieves a lesser FiO2 of about 70%. There is a non-breather with a FiO2 of about 80%. So this is the uh, facial mask. This is the reservoir bag. And this is a rebreather mask. This, the uh, ports here, which you see the small holes and a port. The air can move in both the directions, even, even during inspiration or expiration. So this is a partial rebreather mask. In uh, contrast to the previous uh, mask, th these have flaps over the ports. So they are one-way uh, flaps. So inspiration is not possible. Only exhalation is possible through these ports. So it's a uh, non-rebreather um, uh, mask. And this is the bag, reservoir bag. So you can achieve very high FiO2s with this mask. So as I told you, there are certain conditions which require a constant amount of oxygen to be delivered to the body. As simple as that. If you increase the oxygen concentration, that is basically what this FiO2 means in the inspired air, what happens is the hypoxic drive of the patient is taken away and the patient stops breathing and is almost dead and gone. So you achieve the exactly the opposite result of what you wanted to uh, do that is save the patient. So in such situations where you require constant FiO2, uh, say about 25% or 30% to be uh, delivered to the patient, especially in COPD settings then this uh, mask is very useful. So 
So who is that constant uh, FiO2 tube that is achieved by this port? See, this is attached to the mass. This port is attached to the mass. It has a sort of uh, venturi effect where it sucks in the oxygen and it achieves a constant flow, constant concentration of the oxygen. That's the advantage. So if you use a bigger uh, port, you achieve a higher FiO2. If you use a smaller port, you uh, achieve a lower FiO2. But the beauty of this is it is constant. So suddenly there won't be an increase of uh, concentration in the inspired air. Uh, that's the advantage of this port. This high flow nasal oxygen became very popular in the time of COVID. Here it's like a five star hotel. Uh, the uh, air is uh, heated to the room temperature. It's neither uh, very cold or uh, very warm. It's just at room temperature, uh, which makes it very comfortable to the human body and humidified. The dry air, taking in the dry air is one of the worst experiences. So it is humidified with water. So it makes it more acceptable to the body. So you can achieve very high flows of 40 to 60 liters through wide nasal prongs. Because it's almost body temperature and humidified, it causes minimal discomfort and almost no mucosal injury to the uh, patient. So it's a very useful device. That's what we have found out during this COVID times. Uh, we have avoided a lot of intubations and uh, hooking the patient onto the ventilator. So a lot of uh, patients have come out with high flow nasal oxygen from the ARDS. That's the advantage of this high flow nasal oxygen. So whenever I read about this respiratory dynamics, uh, I find it very difficult to convey it to the students with the type of types, different types of respiratory failure, type 1, type 2, what happens exactly. So basically, if you try to simplify it, it's just uh, combustion. It's like a combustion engine. Uh, the efficiency of gas exchange, what does this combustion engine do? It has to take in the oxygen and give out the carbon dioxide. So that uh, we call it as alveolar ventilation and capillary blood flow, which uh, the basic function of this is the gas exchange, exchange of uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. So this, as we can see, is dependent on ventilation and capillary blood flow, that is V by Q. So this is ventilation, this is perfusion, V by Q. So V by Q less than 1 occurs when capillary blood flow is excessive relative to ventilation. So when the ventilation is less or the capillary blood flow is more, the ratio becomes less than 1. So when it becomes D zero, there is total shunting. I have put this because this is the most common scenario. So this shunting happens in case of pulmonary edema, pneumonia, or atelectasis. So pulmonary edema, the alveolar where the ventilation takes place are filled with fluid. In pneumonia, it is filled with exudates. In atelectasis, the alveoli are collapsed. So that's the problem. So there is almost no ventilation but the blood flow remains steady. So this is the diagrammatic representation. I don't want you to get confused. You just remember the ventilation perfusion ratio. So normally it is one and the ventilation and perfusion are matched. So if the ventilation perfusion ratio is more than one, it means there is increased uh, dead space ventilation. Okay. So this dead space, anato anatomical dead space, physiological dead space, you have read in your physiology classes. So if the ventilation perfusion ratio is more than one, this is what happens. There is more of dead space ventilation. If it is less than one, as I explained in the previous slide, there is shunting. We call as venous admixture. But how do we make out normally in the uh, patient? All this is happening. So. This is the outcome 
and based on this we infer this so if the normal partial pressure pa is partial pressure of oxygen if it is normal it means the vq is matching there is a matching of the ventilation and perfusion if the partial pressure of oxygen is reduced partial pressure of carbon dioxide is increased it means there is increased dead space ventilation if the partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide both are reduced it means there is venous admixture or shunting so this is what we see in the patient and these are the inferences so uh, this is one of the inferences so suppose you uh, uh, do an abg find a arterial blood uh, partial pressure of oxygen is 60 millimeters of mercury or less or the saturation is below 90 percent then it is significant hypoxia you are in the, especially in this covid era we have seen many patients coming with a saturation of 60 percent partial pressure of oxygen uh, very low saturation of 40 percent 50 percent we have seen in our ICUs and emergency wards. So there is a formula uh, where we calculate the alveolar arterial pressure gradient of oxygen. So in situations with hypoxia and uh, alveolar arterial partial pressure of uh, uh, partial pressure gradient is increased, it means there is a ventilation perfusion mismatch and uh, the, you should think of conditions such as pneumonia, ARDS, pulmonary edema or pulmonary embolism. So uh, when the patient comes to the casualty, you detect either by a pulse oximeter or by an ABG that the partial pressure of oxygen is low. Then there is a formula where you calculate the alveolar arterial gradient of oxygen. So that is the next step. So if that is increased, this is the inference. So this is the inference that there is uh, either a pneumonia, ARDS, pulmonary edema or pulmonary embolism. Uh, the other gas is carbon dioxide. So oxygen becomes low in the combustion in the engine, either the oxygen can become low or the carbon dioxide can become high. That's the basic mechanism of the respiratory dynamics. So an arterial PCO2 above 46 millimeters of mercury is abnormal. When does this happen? When there is hypoventilation. So how do you infer this hypoventilation? Again, you look at the alveolar arterial gradient of oxygen. If it is normal, you should suspect this hypoventilation disorder. So when you when the patient comes to the casualty, you detect either hypoxia, hypercapnia or both hypoxia and hypercapnia. So how do you proceed further? How do you decide whether it is a ventilation perfusion mismatch or a hypoventilation disorder? You look at the alveolar arterial gradient of oxygen. So if it is normal, if it, it is a hypoventilation disorder, if it is increased, it is a ventilation perfusion mismatch. So these are some of the examples of the hypoventilation disorders. It's quite obvious brainstem depression when there is the respiratory center itself, uh, center itself is depressed by drugs or the obesity hypoventilation syndrome there is hypoventilation. When there is peripheral neuropathy, uh, critical illness, polyneuropathy, which commonly occurs in the ICU, or the Guillain-Barre syndrome, again, the uh, respiration itself is reduced. You, what you call it as the hypoventilation syndrome. So the respiratory center, nerves, and the muscles, spinal end organ. So, critical illness myopathy, hypophosphatemia, myasthenia gravis, all these cause what is known as hypoventilation syndrome. So I don't want to give more concepts because it will confuse you. If you see these slides and try to explain to one of your friends, so then you will understand much better. That's the basic uh, thing. I can put another uh, lot of slides and give you lots of concepts but uh, 
that will be quite confusing. You just have to remember hypoxia, hypercapnia, alveolar arterial gradient, the two basic things which can go wrong in the uh, oxygen concentration or the carbon dioxide levels in the blood that is one is uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch or hypoventilation. These are the two things which you should try to infer by looking at the blood gases. So this is a slide which uh, I have put to make you understand this type of lectures what we give, the efficacy, retention, that is the most important. I keep on emphasizing what is retained is most, uh, most important. We can put a hundred slides, we can talk very attractively, but what is retained in the end is only 5% with lectures. If you read yourself, it probably goes on to 10%. If you use lot of audio visual aids, probably it goes on to 20%. If you demonstrate, it probably goes to 30%. If you discuss among yourselves, that's the most important thing. Uh, the retention goes up to 50%. If you practice, suppose you enter the ICU, see the devices, see a few ABG reports. So practice doing the uh, retention rate increases to 75%. But if you try to teach somebody, so, so you are in the eighth term, suppose you try to teach a third termer or a fourth termer, uh, what is hypoxia, what is hypercapnia, what is alveolar arterial gradient of oxygen, uh, what is hypoventilation, what is ventilation perfusion mismatch, then I am sure your retention rate goes up to 90%. That's the whole purpose of this brief uh, session what I have done today. So kindly try to teach others whatever simple thing, uh, demonstration of knee jerk or demonstration of uh, um, bronchial breath sounds. You try to teach your uh, uh, fellow students, then the retention becomes very high. Thank you, wish you all the best and thank you.